dear friends and colleagues, I'm talking about electrochemistry without electrodes, but yet I have to use some electrodes to make the comparison. You can understand what's going on. And then finally, I'm going to give you three examples of electrochemistry without electrodes. So we start with a conventional electrochemistry, and I ask that, what is an electrochemical reaction? We know that it is a heterogeneous electron transfer, meaning that electron is transferred between two phases, physical phases. And typically we have an electrochemical cell with electro electrolyte solution and electrodes, and then we connect it to an external power source and a measure current in the voltage. And this is done in large scale in Finland, this picture of copper electrolysis in, in Pori. We have also electrolysis of zinc in Kokkola and some nickel in Harjavalta. And altogether, it's more than one billion annual its value. So it's a big business. But I'm not talking about that tomorrow, today either. So I need a wider definition of electrochemical reaction. It is a reaction, the rate of which depends on a new variable called potential. And this potential comes into chemistry through a definition of an electrochemical potential where this phi is a real quantity, but not measurable. It's galvanic or inner potential. And still I'm keeping that definition that reaction takes place between two phases. And my platform is oil-water system. And the thermodynamic equilibrium condition reads that if we have one ion in common in both phases, then it means that the electrochemical potential of that species must be equal in the both phases. If we expand this uh, equation, we get the very simple and family looking like Nernst equation. There's a standard potential, delta phi zero, and then there's the ratio of the activities of that ion in the oil phase and water phase. And that is the partition co coefficient of that ion. So this very simple equation is the key element of my talk. So if we are able to dissolve electrolytes in two-phase systems so that we have one ion in common, that ion creates a real galvanic potential difference, which can be run, used for running other processes. And this is exactly what I'm trying to explain to you. On the other hand, if we are able to control the potential with, with an auxiliary or external circuit, we can control the partitioning of the ion. And that is the very unique feature of electrochemistry. And it's usually overlooked by non-electrochemists. So my platform is so-called ITs. It's not an Apple product anyway. Uh, so I have an oil phase containing some hydrophobic electrolyte, typically a quaternary alkyl ammonium salt, and any normal electrolyte in the aqueous phase, like sodium chloride. And in between them, there's an formed an interface, which we call ideally polarizable, because the hydrophilic electrolytes are not capable of crossing the interface into the oil phase, and the hydrophobic electrolytes are not capable of crossing the interface to the aqueous phase. And if we do experiments in, with, with electrodes, the cell is something like this. The height is maybe five centimeters, like a matchbox. And the interface is between this lower clear phase and this uh, reddish phase. It just made some colors there to make it more uh, illustrative. So we have electrodes, platinum electrodes providing current, and then we have two reference electrodes controlling the potential. I, I skip the details because I have no time for that. But anyway, we are able to uh, control the, the potential across this water oil interface here. And if we do standard e electrochemical experiment, so-called cyclic voltammetry, so we uh, polarize the interface, the interfacial potential drop with this triangular wave of the order of, let's see, 50 millivolts per second. We get a picture like this. This is a real measurement of my own from 20 years ago. And if we have, let's say, here in lithium chloride in the aqueous phase and this tetrabutyl ammonium and tetrachlorophenyl borate, that's the electrolyte in the oil phase, which is dichroethane, by the way, we got this kind of voltammogram. A large window without no faradic current taking place. 
So on the positive limit, either lithium ion is transferring to oil or the organic anion is coming from oil to water. And on the negative limit, chloride ion is transferring to water or TBA plus is coming into water. And now it depends that which of these ions have lower energy of transfer. We know that in the positive limit it's lithium and, and the negative limit it's TBA plus. So if we push enough with electrical force, then we are able to uh, transfer the ion. So we call that polarization window. And if I add some semi-hydrophobic electrolyte in the aqueous phase, in this case tetraethyl ammonium, it gives the nice wave in the center of the window. And again, this means the transfer of the ion from water to oil and this from and backwards from oil to water. So the idea is that now if I'm able to polarize this interface without electrodes, let's say to plus 650 with using this common ion, then we are doing electrochemistry without electrodes. But we can't do it as such because then we are violating the electron neutrality. If you take an anion, a cation from water phase and put it to organic phase, it, it's not possible unless something else is happening, balancing the charges. And in biology, which I come to next, it's an electron. So heterogeneous electron transfer at this interface is also possible, and we are doing it. So the gist of this system is that the thermodynamic degree of freedom is two. When in normal electrochemistry with one solid electrode and solution, it's one. It means that we have more liberty to uh, attune the system. We are able to vary two thermodynamic, thermodynamic uh, variables, which is an uh, advantage. So I'm not a biochemist, so I'm not going to explain this in detail. But this happens all the time in, our, in the body. So we are all electrochemists. As you can see here, the number of electrons transferred are balanced by proton transfer. And this takes place in, in mitochondria. And ubiquinone is the mediator of the electron from this NID and FID. And then it delivers to cytochrome C. And then in cytochrome C oxidase, the reaction takes place. And, and, and we are reducing uh, oxygen to water. That's the, our basic reaction without which we won't breathe. So taking in a closer look of this cytochrome C oxidase, there's a heme group with a bimetallic core, copper, iron. And this is what we're trying to mimic. OK, first we didn't have a, this bimetallic catalyst, but we started with cobaltoporphin, which is known to catalyze oxygen reduction. And this is the, just the electrolyte in the oil phase to have some conductivity in the system. And then we have ferrocene, which is the not cytochrome C, but ferrocene as an electron donor. And this cobaltoporphin now plays kind of role of the ubiquinone. And if we do this electrochemistry with the electrodes, we can see that the blue line, uh, black line is, is just a plain electro, electrolytes without any, any catalysts or uh, electron donors. And then with the red line is, is just the cobaltoporphin, nothing happens still. And adding ferrocene, still nothing happens really. But if we put all of them together, then we have a really strong current. And looking at in, in closer detail, if we have done an experiment in nitrogen atmosphere, nothing happens. If we use air, then we have some current. But if we use oxygen atmosphere, the current is further increased. So oxygen really is a key player here. If we check the pH dependence, we can see that the higher is the proton concentration, the higher current. See, apparently, we are doing the same thing as what we are trying to do. So this is proton-coupled electron transfer, and a very a big topic in, in bio. Uh, electrochemistry. So th this mechanism is a suggestion. We don't know exactly what is the me mechanism. But anyway, the key point is that the ferrocene is delivering the electrons. And this cobaltoporphin is docking the oxygen for the catalysis. 
And we have two chances, whether we have uh, hydrogen peroxide or water, depending on if you have two electron or four electron pathway. And now we do it for the first time without electrodes. So we put a small flask and put lithium TB in aqueous phase and BATB in the oil phase, in the lower phase. And if we shake them, we are able to calculate what is the, the voltage of that interface or potential drop across the interface. We cannot measure it. We can only calculate it from the theoretical values. And it appears that the, the value of this partitioning equilibrium makes a galvanic potential difference of 540 millivolts, well beyond the positive limit on the region where we have an oxygen reduction assuming taking place. So what we do is just add ferrocene in the lower phase and shake. Easy electrochemistry. No, no instruments, just flask and shake. So we, we are forming hydrogen peroxide. This on UV spectra shows that this first flask is without cobaltoporaphene, and this yellow color is characteristic to ferrocene. And the UV spectrum is black in this upper right corner, and this, there's a broad peak of this ferrocene. And this dotted black line is uh, if you have pure ferrocene solution prior any any mixing. And then we take the flask three without ferrocene, just the cobalt of porphine. There's a pinkish color for the porphine. We have this uh, in the plot. We have blue spectra, and this uh, dotted blue is pure cobalt of porphine solution without mixing. So it means that this the blue solid line means that is a spectrum of cobaltoporphine, which has already docked some oxygen on, onto it. But if you add ferrocene and mix, it turn, turns immediately dark green. And in the spectrum, we can see that this blue line, we have a strong peak of ferrocene. So apparently, electron has transferred. If we take a sample from aqueous phase and use this famous chemistry, or famous but very well known for 100 years, and if we have hydrogen peroxide in the system and we add some iodide, hydrogen peroxide is able to oxidize that in a three iodide. And this had a characteristic peak at 342 nanometers. So clearly, we have produced hydrogen peroxide and ferrocene has converted to ferrocenium. So we have done basic chemical reaction in our, in our uh, respiration chain in a flask. Okay, so the sad thing is that we are doing this lower reaction with two electron transfer, and we should get this upper one in biology. And next experiments we did with some called Pacman porphyrins, which were synthesized in, in France by our Euro partners. And here we have double metallic core. So we have hope of having this four electron transfer reaction. And we did all the same experiments. I don't. Uh, I don't repeat them anymore, but we still were forming some hydrogen peroxide. And DFT calculations done in our lab show that if the oxygen is docking in between of these porphyrin plates, then we have four electron transfer and, and water formation. But if oxygen is docked on surface on the, either of the porphyrin planes, then we have the hydrogen peroxide reaction. Right. Another example is hydrogen evolution, so we can make hydrogen easily. This is done, was, my student was in, in APFL in Lausanne visiting summer and he did it there. So the decamethyl ferrocene was this time the, the electron donor and palladium and platinum chloroaureate was added in the aqueous phase. And now the decamethyl ferrocene gives electron for platinum reducing as a metallic platinum or palladium nanoparticles. And those are then catalyzing hydrogen production. And you can see in this voltammograms in the upper right corner what is the effect of the palladium and platinum. It's clear. So we know that palladium is the best possible hydrogen evolution catalyst. And there's a video of that droplet. I think I have to accelerate it a little bit. You can see formation of hydrogen bubble.
So we can do, in principle, this is very pre preliminary and kind of uh, proof of concept experiment, but in principle, we could use this in the hydrogen economy in the future. Then my last example is something which is just started to run in our lab. So this measurement was done last week. So metallic, metal cations are not capable of crossing this interface if they are not assisted. And this uh, process used in, in hydrometallurgy, of course, we have uh, some organic ligand which is capable of selectively binding cations. And if we do the experiment in it with electrodes with the cell I showed you before, without any ligand or metal cation, we have this blue line, blue window. You realize how wide this window is, it's one volt. Nothing happens in the, in the green line, we add just the metal copper in this case. Nothing happens because copper is not capable of crossing by itself. And then if we add ligand, the, the red curve, there's something on the positive limit, some small wave, which is probably to the proton transfer. So this ligand is also uh, extracting protons. This is slightly acid solution. But if you put both ligand and metal, then we have this greenish, I don't know what is, how to call this color. This greenish color and this have the wave of copper transfer. So this will work. So now I would like to do, again, without electrodes, assigning the potential somewhere 1,200 millivolts plus. And now we can do it in a microemulsion. Instead of having this small cell, if you make it a microemulsion, we have an enormous interfacial area. So it's possible to have some kind of industrial meaning. And what is more important is that this microemulsion does not need to be locally electroneutral. We don't have to compensate the charge transfer by electron transfer or anything else. But each of these oil droplets in water can be considered as, as positive charged particles and they are surrounded by negative counter ions. So this flask is full of capacitors and we have calculated that one liter of this, this microemulsion solution is maybe one farad. Enormous, enormous capacitance. Okay, then it's the question of how to separate the, the microemulsion and collect the metal. And there's an, a trick which my colleague has discovered uh, that adding salt, we can invert the oil in water emulsion to, to water in oil. So it's, it's, it's clever, clever like two-phase electrochemistry, no electrodes. So my conclusions are the following. So this immiscible water oil system can be used as a platform for studying biomimetic or whatever reactions. And we can polarize it chemically without any instrumentation, which is, of course, very easy and it can be scaled up. And, and the last conclusion is that these microemulsions provide a very large area volume ratio. So this could be possibly used for industrial applications in metal extraction, let's say uh, recycling or rare earth metals or whatever, depending on the ligand, of course. There's plenty of chemistry to to be done here. So, I thank you for your attention.